This is video 11 of Tensor Calculus. Back in video 6, we learned how to transform coordinate values from one system to another. In this video, we're going to learn how to transform vectors from one coordinate system to another. And in the process, we're going to learn why the basis vectors we've been talking about in the last two videos are called covariant basis vectors. Back in videos 9 and 10, we defined and illustrated what we call a covariant basis and the covariant basis vectors which are defined as you see here. Now we said a lot about the basis and what that means and how it's used and illustrated it and we keep using this word covariant but we've never really talked about what that means. Well that's what we're going to do today. Okay so to do it we're going to play our old game of using a composite function. And this time it's going to look something like this. We're going to say that r is a function of z, which we know we can do from the last few videos. We, uh, r is a function of the coordinates in our coordinate system. But it can also be represented in terms of the coordinates in our alternate system, our z prime system. Remember, there's nothing special about the Z system. Anything we can do in Z system, we should be able to do in the Z prime system. Well, and then Z prime itself is a function of Z. So on the left, we have just R as a function of Z. On the right, it's a composite function. You've seen this kind of drill before. A little different this time because when we say r is a function of z, z is not a variable by itself. It's a set of variables, as you know. This means it's a list of variables, z, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Therefore, we can't just take the derivative of r with respect to z. We have to take the derivative of r, make it a partial derivative with respect to zi. And that means that we can take the partial with respect to r with each variable individually. So by writing this down with a free index in it, I'm really defining three relationships as I go. All right, to do that with multivariable calculus, of course, I have to take the partial derivative of r then with respect to the z prime system here. So I start with z i and I'll use i prime and uh, when we do have indexes listed specifically we put the prime on the index not on the letter just be aware that i prime is a different index than i and then to complete the composite differentiation I have to follow up with a partial differentiation of z i prime with respect to z i so this is our full differentiation. So notice what I've got here. I've got a free index here. We already talked about that. That means I'm defining three relationships. That free index has to show up in every term in the same place. And then I have this guy, which is a dummy index. It appears once in the upper position, once in the lower position. That means it it's a, an implied summation, and there are three terms. It's a partial of r with respect to z1, 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 z2, z3, and so on. So what I've got here is a uh, an expression that is three expressions, and it's one term on the left and three terms on the right. Okay, now what have we got here? First thing I hope you recognize is that this guy right here is nothing but our covariant basis vector. Likewise, this guy is what the covariant basis would look like if we defined it in the z prime system. Okay, and what's new is this factor. So let's take a moment and come up with a new definition for this last factor we're going to say that the uh, partial derivative of z i prime with respect to z i is going to be defined 
with the letter J, and because it's got an upper index and lower index, we need an upper index here and there. So we're dealing with two free indexes this time. So this is a definition, and we'll call it the Jacobian. Now the official name is the Jacobian of the coordinate transformation, but everybody just calls it the Jacobian. Let's uh, move this up a little bit, and now what we can do is to rewrite our expression above this way. The, this uh, expression in yellow now becomes this. It is our covariant basis vector in the Z system, and I will switch the order of these terms here, is equal to the Jacobian I prime I times the covariant basis vector as defined in the Z prime system like this. Now what this simple expression tells us is, if I know what the basis vectors are in the prime system, and I know what the Jacobian factors are, according to this definition, I can derive or calculate the basis vectors in the unprimed system. In other words, it's a formula that tells us how the basis vectors transform from the prime system to the unprimed system. Now what we're going to discover is that there are many objects of a derivative nature in tensor calculus that transform according to this rule. So we're going to come up with yet another definition. We're going to say that any object, here we'll use A as the object, uh, here it's a scalar, it could also be the vector as you see here, works for vector uh, index vector components as well as index scalar components, but any object such as this which transforms between the unprimed and the prime system according to this rule, just like this, we're going to call this a covariant transformation. And any object that transforms this way is said to be covariant in nature. Now, we represent any covariant type object with the use of a lower index like this. That's why we put the index on the lower position here. It's why we put the index in the lower position of the covariant basis vector itself because it transforms according to this rule. So uh, this is a covariant transformation and any object that transforms this way is said to be covariant. Okay, well let's uh, be clear about something though. We could just as well have started out by a definition that looked like this, ji i prime, which is equal to the partial of z i with respect to z i prime. That is just switching the position of the prime and unprimed um, indexes here. And we could call this the Jacobian inverse. Now using this, we could have uh, derived the next two statements to lead us down to this point, that um, A I prime would be equal to J I I prime A I. And this expression would also be a covariant transformation. The point I'm trying to make here is that the, uh, the definition for the covariant transformation has nothing to do with the, uh, the relationship of a Z prime to the unprimed or vice versa. It has to do with the relationship of the indexes. Here we have the index, the free index, in the lower position on both sides. Well, that's true down here as well. This is the free index this time. And then we have a dummy index that's up here the upper half of the Jacobian with the lower half of this term. Well, that's true down here as well. So it is the form of the expression and the relationship and position of the indexes that determine it to be a covariant transformation. 
we could just as easily have said that this is the definition of the Jacobian and this is its inverse. Each of these, this expression and this expression, are inverses of each other. And we can approach it from either angle. It's valid in both cases. The significant thing is that it's a covariant transformation if the lower index of the Jacobian is the free index in the expression. That's how I remember it. Okay, moving right along, let's uh, get a little space here. And what we're going to do now is to talk about the linear combination. Remember that we said, because of uh, how we defined our covariant basis vectors, that we then had a generalized way of expressing a vector as a linear combination using multiple terms, each of which has a scalar factor and our covariant basis vector like this. OK, but now uh, we keep making the point that anything we can do in the unprimed coordinate system, we can do in the primed coordinate system. So this has to be the same as vi prime times zi prime like this. The vector v itself is an invariant object that is a geometric object that exists totally independent of, of any coordinate system. We've simply found a way to express this as a linear combination using basis vectors in the unprimed system along with some scalar factors that are needed to, to work it all out. We could do the same thing in the z prime system. But no matter how we do it, we have to get the same answer for z. OK, given that, let's, um, and now that we know that there's a way to transform the covariant basis vector in one system to the other, let's um, extend this out just a bit. We would now say that we can rewrite this second expression as vi prime with the equivalent expression for this basis vector as it is uh, transformed to the unprimed system. In other words, I can replace this zi prime vector with uh, j i prime i z i like this. So our transformation equation, let's, let's just again look at what we're talking about. This expression right here is the same as this expression because of how we derived the uh, transformation rule just a couple of minutes ago. All right, now if that's the case, then what it tells us is that um, since this term exists in both of these expressions, then this guy right here must be the same as the product of those two terms. In other words, vi, the scalar component, must be equal to this second expression. I'll, I'll change the order as I did before. Ji, i prime, vi prime. So uh, again, to kind of, you know, I don't want to blow past this too quickly. Because this equals this, and because this equals this, it must be true that this equals this. That's what leads us to the expression. And now we see an expression that looks a lot like a covariant transformation. But it's not the same thing. It's slightly different. So now we're going to come up with one more definition. We're going to say that any object, a i, that transforms according to this rule that this is the definition of what we will call a contravariant transformation. 
Okay, now a contravariant transformation looks a lot like the covariant transformation, but the real key difference is this. The free index this time of the Jacobian is on the top, along with that of the objects that are being transformed. Now we say that any object that transforms according to this rule is contravariant in nature rather than covariant in nature. And we represent any contravariant object with an index that is in the upper position like this. Okay, now it is exactly why we have expressed the scalar factor of our linear combination with an upper index. The linear combination works because the basis vector is covariant and the scalar vector factor here is contravariant and the combination of the two produce an invariant object like this vector. Okay, enough already. If this is uh, your first time seeing this topic, you're probably developing a brain cramp right about now. So let's uh, bring this video to a close and go review the major takeaways. The first thing we did was to define a new object which we call the Jacobian. Now the Jacobian is defined with two free indexes. We have I prime and I. That means that there are a total of nine different elements here. Uh, for each of the three values of I, we can have each of the three values of I prime. Or if we're dealing with higher dimensions, it'll be n squared uh, elements like this. But it's simply the partial derivative of zi prime with respect to zi. And of course, as I just said, there are nine ways that we can do that. Now, I've also written it down from the perspective of the z prime system as well as the unprime system. It doesn't matter which way we go about it. It's, it's still, we can define the Jacobian either way and the inverse as the opposite uh, form. Okay, the next thing we did was to define, use our definition of the Jacobian to define what we call a covariant transformation. And the key indicator on this is that covariant objects are represented with lower indexes and the covariant transformation uses the lower index of the Jacobian as a free index. The upper index of the Jacobian combined with the lower index here is a dummy index. Now the same is true of the relationship if we take it from the z prime perspective. The lower index indicates a covariant object. The use of the lower index here indicates a covariant transformation. And we then found that there is another transformation called a contravariant transformation that's just the opposite. We represent contravariant objects with an upper index and the transformation uses the upper index of the Jacobian like this. And again, it works either for the unprimed or the primed system. Now, just as a matter of interest, the word covariant means that it varies the same way, varies the same way. And the term contravariant means it varies the other way. So that's something that you can kind of help as a memory aid. We're going to find that almost every derivative object in tensor calculus going forward fits into one or the other of these two categories. It's either covariant or contravariant. Anytime you see an index in the upper position, you know we're talking about a contravariant object. And when you see it in the lower position, we're talking about a covariant object. Hopefully all this will make a lot more sense next time as we look at some real live examples of the Jacobian.